to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, riding on a donkey and on a colt, a foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloak on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large cloud spread their crooks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stared and asked, Who is this? The crowd asked, Now, by way of starting, I, I remember one of the presidential movements that happened here to us sometimes in Abuja. I was coming with my family, particularly with my pregnant wife, who was just a few weeks to our due date. And just before we eat the express, we were stopped because of presidential movement. Initially, we didn't even know that it was presidential movement. We just thought it was the regular traffic that would, after a while, we would move. And we were there for the next 30 minutes or thereabouts, and we did not move. This was typical, this is typical of what we experienced in Abuja, particularly when there's presidential movement. And that day, the only thing I was grateful for to God was that my wife was not in labor. Because what would I have done if it was a day she was in labor? It wouldn't have been funny at all if she was in labor and because of presidential movement there was a standstill, we could not go anywhere. While we were speaking about this. We also had people who shared their various experiences. People who had important appointments in life because there was presidential movement and a big man was moving and everybody stopped. Others gave examples of how they, they were flying and they could not land because there was presidential movement and they had to return back to the cities wherever they were coming from. Others had to over around in the sky for a couple of uh, minutes, close to an hour, before they could land because there was presidential movement. This is typical of... The kind of movement we have with the world system. People, roads are blocked and people are prevented from moving because a big man is moving. Now, going back to our lesson today, in the old Greco-Roman world, warriors, particularly led by king or king warriors, announced their victorious return from a crusade or a war, riding majestically on giant stallions with flaring noseries. These warriors come into the town with plunders and with a shout from the people of the land. We'll see something similar for Samuel chapter 18 verse 7 when the woman started shouting as concerning David that Saul had killed his 1,000 and David had killed his 10,000. It is not difficult like I said earlier to witness road closures, traffic diversion and sometimes state holidays in more contemporary times due to the activities of a very important dignitary in our country or in our place. Today's lesson, however, presents to us the typical case of the upside-down nature of God's kingdom. The last, the greatest as the least, and those who desire to be first will begin with service. Jesus, in our lesson today, will also present to us a perfect example of this kind of nature. He, though a king, chose to live as a servant to this for the salvation of humanity we see this in matthew chapter 20 verses 25 to 28 today's lesson focuses on jesus's humility as a leader king at his triumphant entry into jerusalem you almost see that the paradox in this a human humble leader king who comes triumphantly on a coat on a donkey into jerusalem this is the paradox he leader is a king but his humility will not let him do what the world leaders will do he came as a humble servant and he entered into jerusalem and this began the final week of his earthly ministry the evidence of his messiahship as king of zion became irrefutable because this was going to be corroborating the prophecy as given by our prophet Zechariah in Zechariah chapter 9 verses 8 to 10 and verse chapter 14 verse 11. Our lesson is divided into three parts. The first part talks about the royal demand, a royal demand. Matthew chapter 21 verses 1 to 3. By the way, as the lesson continues, if there are any questions you would like us to take, please 
drop them on the chat box there and as the lesson progresses we will take it up from there the royal demand from verses one to three will read as they approached jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with a coat by her, untie, uh, untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Now, on the way to Jericho, on their way from Jericho, Jesus and his disciples neared Bethphage. On the slope of the Mount of Olives, just outside Jerusalem, Jesus sent two disciples into the village to bring a donkey and a colt tied there. Now, Jesus' knowledge of the availability of the colt may have been supernatural. Of course, he's the omniscient God that knows all things. But on the other hand, there was also this probability that the Lord had made prior arrangements to use the animal. But whichever the case, we see complete and immediate obedience, both on the side of the disciples and on the owners of the animal. Now, we do not know the circumstances or and the character of this man, but whatever their acquaintance with Jesus is, we notice that these people, the owners of the cult particularly, acted as stewards of their property, not proprietors. And Jesus, we notice that Jesus gives us this kind of example that we should remember Psalm 24 verse 1 says that the earth is the Lord and everything therein, they and those who, everything and those who dwell in it, they belong to God. And we also must live our life as stewards. This is one big lesson we can learn from these people. Jesus could have chosen to a more flamboyant means to enter into Jerusalem, but he decided to ride on animals as meek as the donkey and colts in his humility. What are life applications we can take away from here? We'll see number one is that the disciples obeyed the command without hesitation. The assignment seemed like a wild errand. It looked like a daylight robbery, improbable of results. However, we notice that the disciples did not question Jesus. They did not ask him, unlike our modern day times, that somebody will tell you, go and do something for me. I, for one, I was telling my I said, one of the things I would try to do, I would ask Jesus, please, did you make prior arrangements? I don't want to be embarrassed. But we didn't see this with the disciples. What they did was they obeyed. They went immediately, Jesus told them, and they went to do what he had instructed them to do. Now, we, however, should also imitate their obedience and have this readiness to fill the lower offices, just like the owner of the court. Another thing we notice is that these people were not naturally known to many people. They were not people that were naturally known, but they still decided to fulfill what God had told them to do. They did their work from behind, and they supported the ministry of Jesus. The Lord needs some of us to serve publicly in the front, but he also will use many whose ministries are performed quietly behind the scenes. It will be a new era in the church when to show that the Lord has need of this or that thing shall suffice to secure his cheerful bestowment. God is still in need of our time, our talents, our properties, and the challenge for us this morning, like the owner of the court and the disciples, is that we must learn to cheerfully to the Lord. Lesson is in verses 4 to 8, a prophecy fulfilled. Verses 4 to 8, a prophecy fulfilled. Matthew 21, verse 4 to 8 says, This took place to fulfill what was spoken. Daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the fall of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus has instructed them. They brought the donkey. their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the tree and spread them on the road. This is the second part of our lesson, the prophecy fulfilled. Now here, we notice that Matthew focused on the prophecy in Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9, where both animals, that is a donkey and a colt, was mentioned. Now, the difference between 
Matthew's account and the other gospel accounts of this same story is that Matthew referred to a donkey and a colt, while other gospels mentioned only a colt. The two disciples that Jesus sent went and did as Jesus has instructed. When Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey's coat, this affirmed his messianic royalty and his humility. So both things were being done at the same time. He entered as a king, confirming his royalty, but he entered also as a humble leader who naturally would have entered on a horse on a stallion, but decided to choose a donkey, a beast of body, to come in. Thus, fulfilling Zachariah's prophecy, an unmistakable sign of his kinship. We see that in their days, donkeys are used primarily for plowing and as beasts of burdens, not for any military procession. The mode was not the standard for kings to arrive, for they usually would come in as conquerors riding on horses. But we see that Jesus, in his humility, even though he was king, he chose to ride on a donkey into Jerusalem. Now, the disciples threw their garments on the cloaks to make saddles. People in the large crowd willingly spread their cloaks and three branches on the roads. Now, you'll notice that it was not Jesus who stirred up the multitude. Their celebration was a spontaneous act by the people who had been anticipating his arrival. You'll notice the gospel according to John. John had told us that, in John chapter 11, verses 55 to 57, after the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead, Bible says people were now anticipating to see whether he was going to come to the Passover, particularly the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, for they had planned to kill him. So people had already anticipated, anticipated his coming, and so when they saw him, it just naturally brought out spontaneous acts of worship from people who genuinely would have seen him and some people who wanted to kill him Rowed in the midst. Now, the nature and of this event was a contagious one, and the crowd responded by paving the triumphal path of Jesus with their cloaks and the freshly cut branches. I would say it's a symbolic way of giving a green carpet welcome to uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What we know in our days is a red carpet welcome, but in Jesus' days, I think what he did, what he got was a great carpet reception. Now, Jesus boldly rode as the king of peace, and the crowd gladly joined him. That what, what are the life applications we can take away from this? Now, Jerusalem was in opera when Jesus entered the city like a beloved king. The crowd cheered him with sounds of praise and worship to God. But we'll notice that it is easy to join in the fun and celebration when the majority is excited. But often, we'll notice that people join the crowds, they shout slogans, but have no personal convictions apart from the crowd. Later, we will notice that this same crowd, a few days down the line, particularly this happened on a Monday, and by Friday, this same crowd were influenced by another people and they started shouting, crucify him. The last part of our lesson talks about the heroic welcome. Verses 9 to 11 of Matthew chapter 21. Verses 9 to 11. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed him shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the old city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowd answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Most of the people were pilgrims from Galilee and on their way to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. They were familiar with Jesus and with the many miracles he had done in Galilee. And as the crowd walked along, they shouted the words of Psalm 118, verse 28. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They also shouted, Hosanna. And Hosanna, originally in the Hebrew word, means save us, we pray. 
taken from Psalm 118, verse 25. Later, this same word, Hosanna, will come to be known, aside from being a petition to God for salvation, it later became a word that people used in praises. It became a note of praise as well as a petition. Now, while the cry them themselves did not fully understand the significance of the whole events they were in, they seemed to acknowledge that this one who is riding on a donkey is the promised seed of David, who had come to grant them salvation. So as Jesus entered into Jerusalem, the whole city was moved and, and they asked, who is this? Now, one would have thought naturally that the question they should have asked that what is going on there, but that was not the question. The question they asked is, who is this? And since Jesus had usually avoided the city, there, was, there were indications that there were probability that the inhabitants of Jerusalem themselves did not know who Jesus was. Now, those accompanying Jesus from out of town kept answering them that, don't you know him? This is Jesus, the prophet from Galilee, in, from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, as the prophets... They were affirming that Jesus is the one promised by Moses in Deuteronomy 18 verse 15 when he was telling them that as I go, God himself will send a prophet like me for you. Jesus may as well had in mind the significance of the prophecy of Daniel concerning the time of the Messiah's coming and that he had arrived in Jerusalem at the very time predicted by Daniel over 500 years ago. You will notice that in Daniel chapter 9 from verses 25 to 26, Daniel had talked about a time where the anointed one will return back to Jerusalem. Now, this event marked the official presentation of Jesus Christ to the whole nation of Israel as the rightful son of David. What life can we take away from here? Now, the shout of a king is not in the church. The ancient glory has departed. The world cares little about the church so long as Christ does not reign in a palaces. That is a quotation I have taken directly from C.H. When we shout in the church, when we shout our hosannas, but there, there is no Christ there, we are only shouting for the fun of it. Now, hosanna will only mean hosanna when Christ is enthroned as king in the church. Now, the question asked again, who is this? And as the question comes to us, particularly in our generation, be able to answer the question. First Peter chapter 3 verse 15 says we should be ready to give an answer for the faith we believe in. And so we must have a deep and true knowledge of Jesus Christ and our answer about who the person of Jesus is should be clear and distinct. I'll conclude. Now following the crowd is often easier than following Jesus. A farm Yet humble savior, a leader king was entering to complete the main essence of his coming to the world, that is to procure our salvation and our redemption. However, the multitude that follow him, they were fickle. They were fickle because they had no true and deep understanding of what they were shouting about on Sunday. And so, an influence came from a different quarter and of a different kind was upon them on Friday, and the same people who had shouted, Hosanna, crown him king, was shouting on Friday, crucify him. We must, however, stand up as individuals and be counted for Christ. The crowd may have the wrong motive. I am also saying that it is also possible that the minority, just like the Pharisees, also had, have a wrong motive. But we don't necessarily have to follow the crowd, neither do we have to follow the minority. We should, however, follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. We should make our personal decisions about Jesus based on our own convictions, not what the crowd is shouting. J.R. Bailey says that there may be an outward devotion to Christ while the act remains a stranger to his nature, his claim, and his love. So today, I charge us, we have seen the triumphant entry of a leader king with humility into Jerusalem. Is that humble king still king in our hearts? Can we, like the multitude, follow Jesus today? Do we have a deep conviction that he is indeed the king of Zion? He is the king, the soon coming king. Or 
just like the crowds are shouting. Our golden text is in verse 5. Golden text is in verse 5 of that Matthew chapter 21. It says, Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on the coat, the fall of the donkey. May the Lord bless us as we look at his word and as we make our hearts what he expects us to be. He has come as a humble king. This week marks, the week we have looked at marks the beginning of the end of his earthly ministry, but the beginning of the salvation he has come to procure for man. Yourself again. Is Jesus really king in my heart? Do I shout and follow the crowd just for the fun of it? Or do I have a deep conviction about the person of Jesus? May the Lord bless us in Jesus' name. I will entertain our questions if there are any on the platform. All right, in the absence of any, I want to bless God for this opportunity to study God's words together. Pray that next week again we'll come together as we look at God's words together. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your week. In Jesus' name, amen.